Well, good evening, and uh, welcome to uh, session four of our How Heal Do You Want to Be class. Uh, glad to see you here tonight, and it's going to be a little special for us because part of what we're going to do tonight is share some of our healing story, and you're going to get to know my wife Robin a little better as well, and uh, some of our stories. So uh, I would like to begin tonight's topic is restoration. And I'd like to begin on that topic by reading a psalm of restoration, uh, Psalm 126. Psalm 126, and uh, it goes, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful tonight to have this time and this space in our life to come together and meet with one another and meet with you over the subject of your healing grace in our life. And tonight, Lord, as we focus on the topic of restoration, may our faith be stirred. May our hearts rise to latch on to your invitation to be restored by the power of who you are in our lives and in our world. We ask God for you to speak to each life, each heart here in very specific ways regarding their restoration. And we pray that we would be a restoration people with a message of restoration to share with our broken world. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, we're going to begin this evening with a video. Uh, I won't say a lot about it, except that it was made about 20 years ago. And uh, it was made uh, not by any efforts that we put out, but because uh, after news of our accident story got out to certain people at uh, CBN Network, they came and said, could we tell your story? Could we come and make a video about your story? And so we said, sure, that would be great. So they came to us and we just followed their instructions and then this is the result. So with Leon's help, and thank you, Leon, again, we're going to go ahead and show you that video now. It was just a normal routine day. And I was going to my daughter's school to pick her up from preschool to bring her home. But on their trip home, Robin Ferris and her children ran into a heavy rainstorm. Her husband, Bill, was working when his cell phone rang. It was from the hospital saying your family's been in a terrible accident, we need you to come right away. During the driving rain, another driver lost control of his truck, crossed the median, and slammed into the Ferris's van. The passenger of the truck was killed. Bill rushed to the hospital, not knowing what he would find. I'm praising God, calling upon him, asking him to intervene, you know, asking him to be there in the midst of all this, and, and then I'm in this next breath, I'm turning around and as if I were talking to the devil and all his demons, I'm saying, oh no, you don't. When Bill reached the hospital, he found that the children were fine, but he wasn't prepared to hear the doctor's report on his wife. And then they sat me down and said, now we need to talk to you about your wife. And it was, it was way too much information. It was doctor after nurse after nurse specialist. You know, saying, now let's go over her orthopedic injury. She's, you know, had tremendous number of fractures. She's got a, a wound nine inches long on the side of her head, so she has brain injury, she had brain trauma. Robin went through emergency surgery to save her life. Mary Kay Bader was part of the trauma team that worked on Robin. She was close to death, not just because of her brain injury, but because of her ability to breathe on her own. Her heart was beating, which was a good sign, but she had a low blood pressure, as well as the uh, severe brain injury. And then she had almost 60 fractures or broken bones in her body. 
So I didn't get to see her till the next morning. But when I saw her, it was shocking because she was swollen up, she was bruised, they had shaved off you know, most of her hair, and she had this big thing sticking out of the top of her skull to monitor her brain, you know, her intracranial pressure. This is the woman that I had been joined to for well over 20 years, and I was going to put my hands on her wherever I could find somewhere that wasn't bandaged and pray for her and watch. Robin was moved to a critical care unit. She was alive, but in a medically induced coma. The first week to two weeks after a tr severe traumatic brain injury are tenuous. The patient can die at any moment, especially if you cannot control the swelling in the brain. And based on Robin's brain injury, as well as her other injuries, we knew we had a, a woman who had basically had every body system that was affected. Bill continued praying for his wife. Then she was slowly awakened from the coma. There was only one outcome in my mind that was acceptable, and that was her recovery. It was really hard. I think it was harder to watch her be in that much pain and awake and aware than it was harder to watch her struggle in the ICU to live. Dozens of broken bones had to heal. Robin also had to recover from a massive brain injury. I slept upstairs in our bedroom while she couldn't even managed stairs, so she was down in, on a hospital bed below. We had a baby monitor between her and me overnight, and I could hear her on the speaker overnight, you know, crying in pain, and, and uh, you know, really, that still gets me. Uh, it was really hard. Robin spent nearly three months in the hospital and rehab before going home. Through prayer, hard work, and family support, she made excellent progress. The first time I walked all the way upstairs with my walker, with my husband, with my therapist, physical therapist, and, and upstairs to the second floor of my house, I just stood there and cried. Even though it's been a slow process, Robin says she knew all along that God would heal her and she would have a good quality of life. Isaiah 41.10 is, has been my scripture, you know, if you're not friend with you, and be not dismayed for I, I will hold your right hand. And I've always felt like God had his right hand around me all the time, you know, and, I've, and I was hanging on as tight as I could. It's our, um, our reward to see someone back in their life, uh, back engaged in and working, you know, towards their, their dream or their goals and always moving forward. And Robin has done that. If you give me two patients with the same injuries, and one has a family and a faith that's strong and one has nobody, I can tell you who's gonna wake up and who's gonna make it back into their life. It's the one with the family and the faith. It is a miracle that she survived. A, that she survived. B, that she had all of her brain use back, that she was able to go back to school and finish her degree, go back to work, be a mom, be a wife. It's awesome to have my life back. I basically, I'm trying to do everything all the time. We have a friend that calls her the miracle lady. And her story has inspired so many people because it was against all odds, you know. It was really against all odds that not only she survived, but that she survived with all of her abilities. I'm thankful to God for his love for me and for never letting me go and for just keeping his hands on me the whole time. share a little bit more detail with you <clears throat> what you just saw is kind of an overview and so everybody this is my wife Rob the day started um, in, in the evening I was due to pick up my kids from school so I drove to school it was rain, you know raining just terribly and um, I had a friend who had asked me, you know, I, I don't want to take my, my, my three-year-old or however old the kids were, we had two, two of them in preschool together, and she said, I, you know, I'd rather not take them, take the little one to go and watch my junior higher's basketball game. As you can imagine, a two-and-a-half-year-old has been in school all day to go to a, you know, basketball game of a junior higher. So she asked me, would you take her home, you know, just keep her till I, because we were good friends. I said, uh, do you have a car seat for me to my car? Because the kid has to, is, a, 
is that age to be in one, they have to be in one, they can't ride my car. And she knows that more than anybody. She said, no, I don't. I only have the one that's built into my car. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't take her. So we're so glad because my daughter was, my 17-year-old son was sitting in the front next to me. And then in the middle seat, it was a, a three-row passenger van. It was the biggest minivan they made, and it was had the highest safety ratings. That's why I bought it. And um, and we also had so many kids we were ferrying to school and soccer that you know we needed more seatbelts. So um, I, I drove, um, you know, just my daughter and my son home. And uh, on the way home, I was uh, hydroplane and T-bone on my car. Um, that picture was definitely my car in there, I think, right? And um, I can't tell you anything about that day. I can tell you what people told me, but that's all. And I have no memory of it, and I never will, according to all the neuro people. Um, when I did wake up in the hospital, it was about a month later, I woke up in ICU attached to everything and, um, you know, people told me, you know, when I got to out of ICU and into the, the rehab department, um, my sisters and anybody who was close to me would come, and, you know, when they came to see me, they'd say the same thing every time. In fact, Bill would say the same thing. He said, you're okay, you have a lot of broken bones, you're gonna be okay, but you know, every, you know, your kids are fine, all the kids are okay, everybody's fine. You know, Andrew, who was in the front of the car, had a broken thumb, and Jean Ann, who was sitting in a booster seat because she's tall and thin and just didn't meet the height, the weight requirement, for a, um, to be without a car seat. So she was in the middle of the three, the middle row of the middle row van, you know, the middle seat. And um, so she, she didn't, you know, have, she was not harmed. She was not harmed. A, a truck hydroplane and hit her. Yeah. At, uh, coming in the opposite direction. So it basically T-boned her minivan. And they were speeding and it was, about a hundred mile an hour impact is what I was told. Um, the uh, um, diagnosis I had was a, a TBI, which is a tra traumatic brain injury, um, which had three intracranial bleeds and brainstem bleeding. And you know, has anybody ever touched the inside of, your, of a skull that's like a not your own, obviously. Um, a model, you know, like a skeleton in a doctor's office. Well, the ins touch it next time, okay? The inside of it is like little spikes everywhere. You know, that's the whole inside of your cranium is just spikes. It's, so you can imagine your brain kind of goes like that when you hit something where you're hit and it hits the spike, the, the really sharp pointy ends in your skull, your cranium, and it, um, it causes bleeding. So I had three intracranial bleeds, and then brain stem bleeding, and brain shearing, which is where your brain and white matter <coughs> separate from the, you know, the hard contusion that your brain takes. And then, did I say 55 broken bones? 55 broken bones, and, um, I think that was it. My my hip was in six pieces because my femur, the top bone, went through my hip. And um, it left it in a few, quite quite six pieces. I, every metatarsal was broken, which are all my toes. And then um, my, both my kneecaps, Bill reminds me. I don't remember that. And then, um, <clears throat> my left arm was in numerous pieces, and um, I had nothing on my face, not even a scratch, nothing. 
except right here I have this nine inches or seven centimeters of, of a, uh, a scope, you know, um, where it was, there was a fracture in there and it was the whole, you know, tissue, the skin and everything was torn apart. So, um, we had to shave my whole head to put in an intracranial pressure monitor, which was right here. I have a nice dent, and and it would read how much oxygen pressure was was in your brain all the time. So when Bill would come see me, they told him you can't talk and you can't touch her because it affects the intracranial pressure when you do that. So it, it makes it go down because it's taking some brain cells to figure out, well, how come you're doing that on the, what's going on with the brain that you're doing that? So he wasn't allowed to touch me anywhere and it was just a very quiet room. And um, anyway, this was what, um, that scenario was what I had to come back from. And I was, like I said, in a coma for a month in ICU. And um, in the midst of that, I also ended up with a trach. And um, I had no, like I said, I had no memory of any of the accident at all. I mean, I would wake up and when, when I was awake and in rehab and they'd come to see me, my two sisters or my, or my husband, Bill, and Three sons, sorry, I don't know how many, I have four kids and they're all spread out. We have four kids. Anyway, um, they were allowed to come later with with an adult. But, um, so, what's taken me to come back is nothing short of a miracle. Um, I've had 21 surgeries since then. And I think I had nine when I left the hospital after and I've had thousands and thousands of hours of physical therapy. And we actually had a physical therapist, an older lady who'd come to the house when I was first home to do PT on my arm, to try to get me to, the, the goal is to touch my nose. And I mean, it was a huge big deal the day I could touch my nose, if you can imagine. I mean, we were rejoicing and she was a wonderful believer, so we were all So, um, um, Jean Ann and Andrew were helped um, out of the car by the person who happened to be the one of the first young men to stop at the car was the son of a vineyard past, pastor in Vineyard Church in Mission Viejo. And he stopped and helped Andrew because he had a fractured thumb, he couldn't undo the seat belt on Jean Ann. So this gen this gentleman, I, was it Brandon? Yep. Good memory. You want me to move it? <laughs> okay. Talk about restoration. Okay, restoration. I'll show. Twenty-one surgeries. Seventy-one days in the hospital. So when I was in the hospital, I have a friend who would come and see me. Knew this was spring, so it was February 10th, and two days from now, and it'll be 23 years. Hard to believe. I get my picture to send out to everybody, remind them. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, my one friend who she knew I loved getting together for Oscar parties, you know. We just watched what we wanted to see and then we would turn it off, you know, <laughs> before it got weird. And um, and so she came of her own mind. She brought a piece of red carpet that was the entrance to my door, to, into my room. This is still in the hospital. Is the carpet No, no, this is when you were still. Oh, when I was in the hospital in rehab. She put it at the entryway of my room. And, and then before the night got went over with, she she gave me this 
um, Oscar um, for best patient. Um, so she's classic, you know. So I was thrilled I got an Oscar. I have to say um, that the um, uh, the other first person, other than this young pastor's young son who stopped, was the first helper type person was the um, division chief for the whole fire department and he was just on his way home from work and he said you know we don't like to stop at accidents when we don't have our gear we have to have our gear with us you know and anything else that they can pull backpacks or whatever but he stopped thank goodness he stopped and then he called a truck to come for every single accident victim because that's the protocol for any accident. So there were um, four fire trucks. And then I guess there was a... There's 21 first responders. Actually, yeah, 21 first responders. And um, one thing that Bill and I did, it was, it was kind of a, a fun thing to do after I was up on my feet and walking with a walker. Um, we, um, we had a picture of the four of us that were in the car at the time in, in this picture, and it was kind of like, you know, it said, it had a poem or something on there, and it said, because of your, because you cared or something, and you came, you stopped, and you helped, or, or you know, and for your, you know, for your, um, incredible care at the scene. And so we gave them this framed portrait of myself and the kids. And um, and then we knew a chocolatier in South Orange County. So we had 21 chocolate um, uh, uh, Oscars made. So we gave each fireman that. And I have a friend who's um, whose husband's a firefighter, so that's how we got the names of all the people that were on my call. And so that's what we did, and it was just a blast to go do that and to see them, and they just, they were shocked. They said, we never hear from anybody. We, no, nobody ever comes back. We, we never hear from them. And it's like, I could not go back. I had to, you know, say thank you. Um, so, okay, I gotta be quick. Other things, you know, I had a lot to be restored from one, a person, and then as a wife, as a mom, as a nursing professional, I was an RN, and and then driving down that road and all the PTSD that I went through, and it was I don't, quite a while before I drove down that road to take my kids to school. And, and the same with my 17-year-old in the front seat. He took him a while just to even drive his car. And um, I went to work eventually at the hospital where I was taken, Mission Hospital in South Orange County. Mm -hmm. And I worked there in labor delivery for I think it was six years. And um, fantastic, There's just, it's an amazing hospital. It's the, their trauma unit's like nothing else. And um, I know it's already been said, Isaiah 41.10, but I'll say it again, because that was what the scripture that was on my brain when people finally, that were, when Bill would come in and I'd recognize a face or a person. And, and it's, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And, you know, I... You, I can hear my brain says that every day. I mean, no matter, you know, what kind of day I'm having, it might be a great day, but it's like, Yahoo, I'm so glad that God, His right hand is around me all the time. So when I feel like I'm going to fall flat on my face, when I'm, when I'm usually walking, but this is post-COVID, um, my lovely chair. But anyway, I'm um, still praying to walk. But, um... So even when it would be damp out or, or maybe just, um, you know, just a few raindrops and I want to go outside or we do something in the rain, you know, I just, you know, remember Lord, I'm, I'm, you're holding on to me and I'm holding on to you, the right hand, we got each other in the right hand, you know, and, uh, and you know, God just planted that on my brain and in my entire being. So once I got to where I was walking and working and sort of functioning, I, I mean, I felt like I was strong enough 
enough to where I could go back and finish my bachelor's degree, which every hospital wants you to have a bachelor's degree in nursing. So I went to a 15-month program, um, which was at Azusa Pacific University, and in 15 months I finished the four years, but I'd already had a two-year ADN, but it was still crazy. It was called their Accelerated Degree Program. And this lovely person here typed every paper I had. Because I'm not a typist. I'm, I'm, I don't have that skill. I still don't. I mean, I can get by. I, I was on my own for my master's, right? He told me ahead of time. <laughs> so then I went back and I got my master's. And I loved it. I ended up in the Nursing Honor Society, which is not um, an easy feat. And what else? Then I've been teaching, I'm just not, I, I ran around and did l and for another six years post-accident. And since then I've been, since I got my master's, um, the biggest nursing shortage begins at the faculty level because they say by statistics there's only 17% nurses having a master's degree, which is what you have to have to teach. So I had a job waiting for me the minute I finished grad, when I finished school. So, um, I want to say my master's was a lot more fun than my speed degree, but, um, but anyway, I just had to share some of those little um, remembrances that, you know, sometimes somebody else, something will just pop into my head for no reason. I'm sure it's God reminding me where it came from because it was pretty dark. So, um, it was just what that you know, was said on the film. Thank you, Penny. You're welcome. All right. Yeah, so her, uh, her return to school after three brain injuries was pretty remarkable, not to mention her difficulty ambulating and everything, but she did it, and she drove herself there, she did all the studies, and, you know, this is what I wanted to talk about, was this idea of restoration coming back from something. So before I go on, I'm going to help my wife back down onto the ground here. You need extra? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to just kind of spot us. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna go, go backwards. Thank you. cookies by the coffee if you want some. <laughs> so, um, restoration is the topic. And Robin's story, our story, is part of that. Uh, since that experience with the accident, uh, the wheelchair now really doesn't have anything to do directly with the accident 23 years ago. That has to do with the fact that she almost died during COVID and was in the hospital fighting for her life at that point. And uh, came through another serious uh, struggle to live and by again by the grace of God you know so she's still coming back we're still coming back from that but we're grateful we're grateful to be here we're grateful to be with you guys I want to talk about this idea of restoration in kind of a backdrop because um, restoration is one of the greatest and most prevalent themes in scripture and I mean that by saying that the promises and the visible signs of restoration through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, uh, are against a backdrop of, of a what I'm calling the ultimate super restoration that we're all waiting for at the return of Christ. When all things will be restored, all things will be made new. Everything that we experience in the now of restoration in this season of our lives is a is related to this ultimate super restoration that is going to come at the end of the age. And as it says in Revelation 21, 5, and he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, right, for these words are true and faithful. So the one who sits on the throne is going to make all things new. And so any restoration we experience now 
is just a foretaste of the coming ultimate super restoration that's going to have happen in the return of Christ in the end of the age. And uh, so, who is the one who restores? Well, it's it's God, the one seated upon the throne. And who? What will He make new? Well, He will make all things new, according to that same passage. And can we count on this? And of course, the assurance comes back through the, through the text. These words are true and faithful. God, who is on the throne is going to make all things new, and we can count on that because His words are true and faithful. So, so Scripture portrays God as the great restorer, the active force behind past, past restoration, present restoration, and the ultimate super restoration to come. All present experiences of restoration are hints or foretastes of this ultimate super restoration at the end of the age. We call this the already and the not yet. So much about our Christian life, so much about our experience, our faith experiences, so much about how we are touched by God, how we experience the kingdom of God, how we interact with the Holy Spirit and with God's work in our life and in our world. They, they are foretastes. They are touches of the future into the now. So we have this sense of what's coming. A lot more of the goodness of God that we experience in the now. All healing, all restoration, all redemption, which we'll talk about next week. All of these features and factors are foretastes of the coming age at the return of Christ. And so we call this, we are living in the already, yes, we're getting some taste of that, and the not yet, because there is a coming ultimate super restoration that will make all things new. So the biblical notion of restoration acknowledges the losses, the reversals, the sufferings, and the uh, degradations of the physical, moral, and spiritual realities in which we live. So the Bible doesn't, as you well know, does not um, pretend like this world is not full of those things. And you say, you know, how could someone like Robin, bringing her two children home from school, why would she suffer so? Why would these children have to go through that with their mother? Uh, you know, what, what, what's the purpose? What was God trying to teach? You know, all those kinds of questions come up around anything that you've gone through, that I've gone through, that seem inconsistent with our desire to be, you know, safe and good and whole and sound and all these things we've been talking about as we've been looking at healing. And we say, how does God allow this? Why does God, why does God not prevent this? You know, why are these things allowed? And I remember a very important conversation Robin and I had. Um, about seven months or so after she came home from the hospital. I know this because she couldn't go upstairs to our bedroom for seven months. And I remember it was at some time that we were upstairs lying in bed one night talking. She was crying and saying, why did God let this happen? I was just bringing my kids home from school. You know, we had been literally sent out to plant a church four days before this accident. Um, there was a lot kind of backstory to all this. And it just didn't make sense. This was not in the church planter's handbook. Have a, have a Johnny Baxter. You know. um, but anyway, I thought for a second and I said, you know, honey, I don't know that we can even know a tidy answer to that question. Why? Why did God let it happen? There's things in your life, I'm sure, in your family, in your story, in your life, and somewhere in, in the reach of your life, you go, why did God let that happen? Why did God allow this? It was terrible. It was awful. Why would a good God allow these things to take place in me, in my body, in my life, my, my family, whatever it might be? And so you want a tidy answer. We reach for that, that nice, clean, tidy, it's because, the, okay, now I get, it makes perfect sense now. But you know, I'm actually going through the Bible every morning and I'm in Job right now. And that's really the spirit of Job's uh, Job's uh, advisors and, and counselors was they kept on trying to make everything fit into a tidy box and explain Job's troubles to him by that. And of course, the, by the end of the book, God sort of explodes that box and says, you just don't even know what you're talking about. And, and, and so I said, I don't know that we can know the why, but here's what I do know. God was there. God was there. 
God was there on the accident scene. There was at least two signs to me of God's fingerprints on that accident scene. One was the, the, the son of the vineyard pastor who we did not even know him. He happened, it happened upon the accident right after it happened, helped our kids. And then the, the off-duty division chief from the fire department pulling up right behind that, calling in all the first responders. It was just a little way of God saying, I'm here, I've got you. The incredible care she received. And remember I said miracles come in three sizes. What were those three sizes? Small, medium, and large. Okay, large, right? So all along the way, in your life and in my life, and in this situation that we're telling you about, there were small miracles, there were medium miracles, and here's the largest miracle. The largest miracle was the brain shearing. And the brain shearing is a condition from the amount of impact on her head into the side window. There was the stripping of the neurons, gray matter and white matter separating in some part of her brain. Now, I didn't know this, she didn't know this, we didn't know this the whole time she was in the ICU. We had no knowledge of this except that when she came back to bring candy to the nurses in the ICU, nurses know that nurses love candy. See, this is a thing. So she said, I want to take a big bunch of Easter candy to the nurses in the ICU, and I want to meet them and say thank you, because she was unconscious the whole time she was with them. So we walked in there one day, rolled her in, and she had the big candy, and they came running up, Robin, 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 it's so good to see you. You're on our wall of fame, you know? And they said, you had brain shearing. In the first MRI, and then you didn't in the second one. And we went, what, what? We had not heard this story. And, and, and we said, are you sure? And they, they cited something that they understood as trained professionals about something about a happy camper face and something that they were describing in the MRI. And they said, yeah, you had this and that and the other, and then you did it. And, and so we had one more uh, appointment with her neurosurgeon, Dr. Gross. <clears throat> to finish up his care of her. And, he, and, and we said, Dr. Gross, when we went to see the nurses, they were all talking about brain shearing. It was there, then it wasn't. Did you see brain shearing? And he said, well, I, I thought I did. And I said, well, let me get this straight. If it was there and then it wasn't there, that's a miracle, right? And he goes, that's your call. I said, okay, I call it a miracle. That wasn't hard. <laughs> and so you see this, this, uh, this whole reality is that there were still hundreds of hours of physical therapy, surgeries, you know, struggle, pain, difficulty, touch the nose, all that, right? And many other things that we could go into long detail about, but won't. But the point being is that there were small miracles along the way, there were medium miracles along the way, and then there was that pretty big mega miracle of the brain, of the brain shearing. So, <clears throat> restoration, restoration, things coming back, things coming back. Robin's identity coming back, Robin's function as a wife, a mother, a nurse. These things all had to come back in time, in waves. And then when she caught that wave, then she went on and finished her bachelor's degree, finished her master's degree, got into teaching, you know, continued to just ride that, ride that wave of restoration. And that's the grace of God in our life, is that as restoration comes and we embrace it, we don't always know why the bad things happen, but as we embrace the restoration, we find that we're being carried along and lifted and if we say yes, and if we hang tight to that little miracle, oh, it's just a little one. Oh, you'd almost miss it, it's so small. But if you identify it and, and are grateful and you hang on to that and you build on it, and then here comes a medium miracle, and then you go, okay, that's the Lord. I'm gonna hang on, I'm gonna receive that, I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna note that, I'm gonna build on that. My faith's gonna grow a little bit more. I'm gonna trust a little bit more what God is doing. And, and so on and so on. And sometimes here comes these mega miracles, these big ones. And, and, and you just build and you build and you build and you keep going and you keep going. How far can you go? We don't know. There's no promise that everything that gets lost in this life is going to come back in this life. But we do know that ultimate super restoration is coming in which all things will be made new. All sickness, all death, all tears will go away and we will have everything as it should be once again forever and ever so we go toward that mark we press toward that mark as paul said that high mark we aim for whatever's happening in your life that is restorative cling to it drink it in build on it you know take it as far as you can go and then look for that next one then that next one and that next one we'll see how far 
how far you can come back from what has taken you down or taken you out. And so if you're watching on, online, if you're here in the room, you know, I want to encourage you, don't despise the day of small beginnings. That's what the Bible says. Don't despise the, what one of the prophets said, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Don't think that because it's not a mega miracle on the front end that nothing's happening. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 6, it says, As you do not know, excuse me, verse 4, As you do not know the way of the wind or the way that a child is formed in the womb of its mother, so you do not know the works of God, the creator of all things. What does that mean? It means that God's work is sometimes hidden and mysterious. You cannot see with your naked eyes the growth of a child in the side of the womb of its mother. You can't, you can watch it over time, but you can't see its heart beating. You can't see its, all of its movement, but it's happening out of your sight and beyond. It's mysterious. You don't, you can see the effect of the wind. And even Jesus talked about this in John chapter three to Nicodemus. The wind blows where it wills and you can see the effects, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. And so this is the way of the Spirit. This is the way of God's work. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. Just because you don't understand it or have the tidy answers doesn't mean that God isn't at work. And sometimes we find, like when a baby is born and suddenly there's this revelation, you know, eight and a half pounds of revelation coming out perhaps. You know, uh, this is what God has been doing in the, in, in the womb of his or her mother, right? And ba-bam! Now you see it. But it was happening for months and months and months out of your sight. And that's the way the work of God often is. It's taking place. It's moving. It's happening. But it's not always perceptible to our easy senses. And we have to sometimes just trust what we can't see. The mystery of restoration. So the Hebrew people... Um, give us a meta-narrative. I've been telling you about these big stories in Scripture with each of these five R's we've been looking at. Uh, we talked about the removal of that which is causing injury as the exodus from Egypt. We talked about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the repair story last time and the repair of the temple and the city walls of Jerusalem under Nehemiah and Zerubbabel. And then the big story of restoration is, is the story of the Hebrew people coming back after the captivity. That's Psalm 126. That's the passage I read when we started tonight. And I want to take you uh, to another scripture passage uh, that tells us about, in the big story of Israel's restoration, gives us hints about God's restorative nature and his restorative plans. And this is from Isaiah 49, 8 through 16. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances. To say to the captives, come out and those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads, and my highways will be raised up. See, they will come from afar, from the north, some from the west, some from the regions of Aswan. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst forth into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Here's the Lord's answer. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Beautiful picture of God's nature to restore, to bring us back, to take us from captivity, to take us from loss, to take us from reversals, destruction in our life, and bring us back to where we shout with joy, to where we see the good hand of God upon us and in our life. So here's what restoration is not, however, and I want to make this very plain. 
the goal of restoration is not to go backwards to a replica of an earlier season. Does that make sense to you? When God restores you, he doesn't take you backwards to an old version of you. He doesn't take you backwards. He takes you onwards and he takes some of the best of who you've been and then adds to it in the restoration process and gives us a new experience of ourselves, our lives, and his grace in the process. And sometimes I have to talk to couples who are in trouble, who are in crisis. Maybe there's been adultery. Maybe there's just been other kinds of crisis in their life. And sometimes I think that the feeling is, I want to go back. I want to go back to how it was before all this awful happened. I don't want this as part of our story. I don't like that this took place. I don't want this to be, you know, a, a reality. Uh, can God take us back? It's like, you know, can we go back? And then I have to tell that couple, no. This is not about going back. This is not about reclaiming a life that you've already lived before all this happened. This is about going on with God to what is going to come out of this that is going to be a sign of his restoring, redeeming work. We're going to find the way forward, not the way backward. And that's a very important distinction. So here's what restoration is. God's restoring work inaugurates a new chapter, a new season, and a new era, which draws from the best of the past and brings key elements of well-being forward in new and vital ways. There is suffering in this life, but God assures us that restoration will get the last word over our suffering. And I think this is such an important thing as we're trying to walk with God in the healing journey is to understand that suffering and difficulty is part of the healing journey. It's not an exception to the healing journey. Along the way, we may still struggle. We may still suffer. We may still go through difficulty and crisis and need. But God is redeeming and restoring all along the way. And in that process, he's building into our story a bigger story. I, I love the story, as you probably know it, of uh, Bethany Hamilton, the soul surfer, the young woman who is now 32, but when she was 13, so around the same time as Robin's accident, uh, she was, as you, as you may well know, was uh, surfing in Hawaii near her family home. She was a, an up-and-coming championship surfer, and a tiger shark, 14-foot long tiger shark, bit off her left arm. And of course, this required a tremendous amount of medical uh, attention and, and, and her recovery and survival, you know, was a, a medical, uh, a medical, uh, um, I want to say miracle, really, or it was a, a very um, detailed medical procedures that took place in fall of that. But how many of you know the body consciousness of a 13-year-old girl? How many of you understand that a 13-year-old girl comparing herself to other girls and feeling that she has no arm on one side of her body. And an up-and-coming surfing champion who is now wondering, will I ever be able to compete again? How many things did Bethany Hamilton lose? Some visible as her arm and some invisible like her self-image, like her sense of accomplishment. And what she began to do is she began to say to God, and she will say, this doesn't mean this was easy or that I had no dark moments or difficult moments, but her attitude was prevailing this. God, if this is what you have, if this is what's on the menu, if this is what you have for me, I'm going to trust you and go with this. And we're going to try to make the best of it. And she uses a word that the restoration-minded people understand, that my wife understands. You heard her say at the end of the video, I'm always trying to do everything all the time. Well, that was 23 years ago. She's still trying to do everything all the time. The word is unstoppable. The spirit of restoration is an unstoppableness. It says, it declares, this accident, this sickness, this loss, this reversal, real, painful, powerful, impactful in my life, 
however, is not going to get the last word over who I get to be from here. That's up to God. He gets the last word. And I'm going to go with this and see what God wants to do with whatever I have to have to offer him, which at this point may not be a lie. But what I have, I give to you, Lord. The broken pieces, such as they are. If you can make something of this, please make something of this. I want to be unstoppable. I want to find that faith, that hope, that love that puts me back in the game in some way, in some form. And, and you can say, well, well, because Bethany Hamilton was nearly killed by a tiger shark and because she lost her arm and because of her attitude, you know, now she has a ministry and a movie and all kinds of reach all over the world to inspire people and help people, men, women, boys, girls, all kinds of people have taken so much from her story, inspired at incredible levels. And you say, well, so that's why God let it happen. You know, that's the, the tidy answer to Bethany Hamilton's lost arm. I don't think so. I don't think that, that God has a ledger in heaven where he adds that all up and goes, yeah, that's worth it. Let's just put that into the mix. But I do think this. Bethany Hamilton said, I don't pretend to understand why. I can't tell you in a tidy way what, what the meaning of my lost arm is. But it's what I've got to work with. And if God will open the doors, I'll start to share the story. I'll start to try to encourage other people with the encouragement I've received. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We comfort others with the comfort we've received. If we're going through a restoration, if we're going through recovery, if we're going through renewal, it's because we are now trying to give away at some point in that process what we have received. As part, of our, uh, as part of our recovery. And so, restoration happens. God gets the last word. And only God knows what it will all look like at the end of the story. Listen to 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11. There is suffering in this life, but God assures us that restoration will get the last word. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that something? I love how in that passage Peter says God will himself restore you. He is the God of restoration. It is in his nature. It is part of his covenant. We see it in the history of the Jewish people as we read the Old Testament. We see it in the now of our lives as we seek to trust God with our losses and reversals. It is God who's going to bring the restoration. But we get to cooperate with that. We get to take those little miracles, those medium miracles, those big miracles, and receive them and attach to them and use them as little stepping stones to walk with God as far as we can into that process of restoration. Now I want to tell you about another wonderfully vivid picture of restoration that I... I actually learned from a counseling client of mine, and I didn't bring it, but uh, I have a show and tell in my office that actually pertains to this wonderful, wonderful illustration. And uh, actually on my uh, YouTube channel, there's a video that I made about it called The Gospel According to Kintsugi. And if you, it's my most popular video. And if you wanna watch it, it will tell this in kind of some more visual detail. But, Kintsugi, as it turns out, is the Japanese art of restoring pottery and ceramics that have been broken. And in this example of Kintsugi, we have a wonderful picture of how God works with our brokenness in bringing about restoration. So my client actually gave me a little teacup that has had this treatment done to it. You may have already seen 
pictures or you may have a piece of kintsugi pottery yourself. But the philosophy behind kintsugi is this. If this piece means something to you, it doesn't have to necessarily be an expensive piece. It's just a meaningful piece of ceramic or pottery, but it got broken and you want it to be restored, what you do is you take it to the kintsugi master, the artisan, the master craftsman who's going to um, deal with your broken piece of pottery. And he or she is going to go through a process that has basically two phases to it. One is they're going to create a lacquer, a sort of a glue that is going to glue the pieces of the broken pottery back together. And that, that, in the old sense, in the, in the old art, that lacquer comes from a tree that has to die in order to yield up enough sap to create the lacquer. When I first heard that, I had sent chills down my spine. It made me think of Jesus. It made me think that for Jesus to give us the material of restoration and redemption, he had to die, he had to yield up. And so that tree has to die, and it yields up enough sap, enough, enough of this base product to create the lacquer that now glues the, the, the pieces back together. And then it sets up for some time. I believe it could be months, or at least a couple of months, for this lacquer to set up. And then once it sets up and is back together, the goal is not to erase the cracks. It's not to try to make it. Remember I said... God's restoration is not about going back in time. It's not trying to make the pottery look like it did before it got broken. Instead, the master craftsman outlines all the cracks with liquid gold and runs veins of gold down those cracks as if to accent and emphasize the broken pieces. Why? Why? Well, the philosophy behind Kintsugi is very simple. Everything in this life breaks. It's the nature of things in life. And so we're not going to be ashamed of our brokenness. We're not going to try to hide it or pretend like it's not real. We're going to, however, put it in the hands of a master, a craftsman who has skill that can rebuild from the broken pieces a, a story of brokenness that has been deftly handled by a master craftsman and touched with gold and repaired to tell a story. A story that a perfectly formed piece can't tell. And as I describe this in the video, The Gospel According to Kintsugi, I quote from the singer-songwriter Leonard Cohen, who in his song Anthem has a line that just speaks to this so beautifully. Ring those bells that still must ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. There's a crack. A crack in you. A crack in me. A crack in our story. And we look at it and we go, I'm so ashamed. Ashamed of my brokenness. Ashamed of what's been done to me. Ashamed of what I've done to myself. I'm cracked. I'm broken. And Leonard, Leonard Cohen reminds us so poetically, yes, those cracks are how the light gets in. Don't be ashamed. Put yourself in the hands of the master potter who knows how to take those cracks, those pieces, put them back together again and tell a story that can't be told any other way of restoration. And that's why I call it the gospel according to Kintsuki. In light of this ultimate super restoration, the one that's coming in the arrival of the new age at the return of Christ, we are encouraged to seek restoration in the present as we walk with God. I'd like to read from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and 
forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems you from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The way that restoration works, the mechanism of restoration then is this. We arrive broken in some way or in a number of ways before God. And God who is on his throne, God who is the author and the perfecter of faith, the scripture says, God who is, Paul says, I am confident of this very thing, that he that is at work in you will perform that work until the day of Christ. God, who is the author of this restorative process, encounters you in your brokenness and begins to bring about restoration, recovery, and as we'll see next week, redemption. And what we have to meet God with as He reaches for us in our broken state and offers to work in our life in a restorative way, we, we have two things that we meet Him with. Hope. Hope. I hope. I hope it can get better. I hope this can go as far as I hope it can go. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, hope does not make us ashamed. In other words, you're not stupid to hope. You're not an idiot to hope. You're not a fool to hope. Because, he goes on, Paul goes on, because the love of God has been poured abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So we meet God with hope. And hope is a very desirable quality. It holds us over while we're in the mystery of restoration. And we meet God also with faith. Faith. Well, what is faith? Faith is not presumption. It's not telling God what he's doing and how he has to do it and how far it has to go and blah, blah, blah. blah. It's not commanding God. Faith isn't. Faith is connecting with what God is doing and saying yes to it. Faith is agreeing with God's work. Faith is climbing on to the miracles and saying yes more Lord more miracles more grace more change more hope more restoration I'm trusting you for more that's what faith is and there's two kinds of faith there is what I call muscle faith what do I mean well as you just walk with the Lord over days months and years you work your faith muscles and as you work your faith muscles, they get bigger and stronger, and your faith grows. It's like lifting weights or doing exercise or doing anything by which muscles get stronger and bigger. Well, what's the key element in that? Resistance, weight, challenge. If I'm lifting that 50-pound weight, and I'm straining, and I'm going, oh, this hurts to try to lift this weight. It's actually building muscle, I'm told, in me. And after enough time goes by, if I keep at it and I keep enduring the pain of using my little weight faith, <laughs> I find that I can do 50 pounds pretty good. And so then it's like, let's put 70 pounds on or 60 pounds or 80 pounds. Let's increase the resistance even more. Let's make it even harder. Darn, I just got 50 down. Now I got to hurt again. You know, now I got to struggle again. Okay, here we go. Mm -mm -mm. And that's muscle faith. And at the edge of that muscle faith, as your faith grows that way, 
That's, 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 that's what James talks about in James chapter 1, the trying of your faith, you know, creates all this goodness, all this endurance, right? That's James chapter 1. You know, rejoice in your tribulations, rejoice, be happy, because it's building your faith muscles, basically, is what he's saying there. And as that, as that continues to go, there is an edge where it hurts. And you know what that edge is? Doubt. Doubt. And sometimes I have to tell people, they say, Bill, I love the Lord. I'm trusting the Lord. I, 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 I'm using my faith, but I have such doubts. I struggle with doubt. And I say, oh, good. That's really good. They're going, what? I thought you were a Christian. <laughs> I say, no, it's good that you doubt. Because doubt is the edge of faith. It's where it hurts to believe is where you doubt. That means you're pushing against your comfortable faith where you already have your 50 pounds handled and you're stretching and pushing into 80, 70. And it hurts to do that and so you doubt and that doubt is a sign that you're trying to break into a new level of faith. Now that's different than unbelief. Unbelief is where you take the barbell and you throw it on the ground and you walk away. So when I say doubt, I always like to cite this interesting passage from Matthew 28. The passage, the verse right before the Great Commission in which Jesus sends the disciples out into all the world. Do you know the passage? Do you ever look at the verse right before that? It says that the disciples came to meet Jesus on the mountain and they worshipped him and some doubted. It's right there. Look it up. Here they're looking at the risen Christ standing right in front of them, about to tell them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. They've been with him post-resurrection already. He's been with them. He's been teaching. And they're on the mountain and they're looking at him. And they're, some of them anyway are going, there he is. Really? Really? Is this? Yeah. They worship and doubt at the same time. Doesn't that sound like you? <laughs> it sounds like me sometimes. While I'm worshiping the Lord within my safe, strong, muscular achievement up to this point in my walk, where I'm comfortable in faith, I'm worshiping, but at the edge of that, I'm also doubting. Because it hurts to believe at that point. That means I'm pushing. I'm pushing in and it's okay. Those doubts are okay. Just don't let them turn into unbelief. Don't walk away. Don't stop trying. Your doubt does not disqualify you from your restoration. It's part of it. So that's the mus muscle faith, the muscle building faith that we develop by going through hard things and trusting God and learning to get stronger and stronger in that faith. But there's another kind of faith. The Bible speaks of it as a gift of faith. This is faith that is given to you and imparted to you when you're in the midst of your struggle of restoration and redemption. When you're trying to push in, when you're trying to believe, when you're trying to trust. But you know, you just need like that propellant. You just need that infusion. You just need that, I just know, sometimes they say, I just know in my know -like that God's going to do this. And it's not something that you whip up or that you presume. It's something that God gives you a knowing about and you just know what God's going to do. You just know that He's on the move. You just know that it's going to get better. You just know. Now that's not something you can fake or pretend or whip up in some emotional way. It may not even be very emotional. It may just be this knowing that God gives you sometimes when you're in the process of restoration. And even when things are going backwards and you're losing ground you gained and you go, I don't know, I don't know. And then, and you're trying to push and you're trying to use those faith muscles. And, and like Paul says in, in, in Ephesians 6, you're just trying to stand. You're not even trying to gain new ground. You're just trying to hold on the ground you already got. And all of a sudden, you just know God says, let me give you a little gift of faith. And you just go, you know what? It's going to be okay. Well, how do you know? I just know. 
Well, can you prove it? No. Well, what evidence do you have? None. I just know. I have a gift of faith. So we meet God as He reaches for us in restorative power with hope and with those two kinds of faith. Muscle faith and sometimes a gift of faith that He gives us to trust and believe. And then we gain some ground. And the small and the medium and the large miracles, the slow, the, the little faster, and the really sometimes really fast miracles come. And we start to experience redemption and lift. And we start to experience gaining ground. And we start to go, okay, how far can I, how, how far can I take this? Where, where is this going to take me? Where is this going to go? What's next? I don't know, but I'm going to try to grab onto what this little thing that's happened that's encouraging me, that's giving me hope, that's giving me faith, and I'm going to just try to build on that puppy as much as I can and see what God will do. I'm going to end on Psalm 71, 20. You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again from the depths of the earth you will bring me up again you will revive me again from the depths of the earth you will bring me up again you might say that the, the other meta narrative of restoration in scripture Besides the Jews' return from captivity in Babylon and the restoration of their life in the promised land is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a sign and a symbol and a signal that God is in the restoration business. And we are tied to that restoration, that resurrection. His resurrection has now become the assurance of our resurrection. And we enter into that upward lifting power so that Paul says, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, it will quicken your mortal bodies. We experience the overflow of resurrection. Jesus said to Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the uplifter. I'm the restorer. I am the restored one and I'm the restorer of others. Amen? Amen. All right. So, let's look at the reflection questions, which I forgot to do last week, by the way. Thank you for not pointing that out. All right. Let's look at these. Uh, number one. Identify one area of your life that stands in need of restoration. Bill, are you kidding me? I got 15. Sometimes when people come for prayer, in times when I've been, you know, involved with, with prayer ministry, and they'll say, I'd like prayer. And I'll say, okay, what would you like prayer for? And they'll say, well, this and this and this and this and this. And they start to run down a list of things. And I appreciate that they are facing many, many difficulties and trials of life, but like lots of prayer for lots of things. But I, I learned somewhere along the way to ask this question. Okay, I, I hear that you have these many needs, and I appreciate that. But let's, for the sake of the focus of our faith, why don't you pick one? What would you like the Lord to do in your life in one area that you've just mentioned right now? And let's focus our faith on one thing. So that, that word one there is very intentional. You might have 20 things, but find one that stands in need of restoration. What will be different about it following God's ultimate super restoration of all things? Well, wait a minute. What do you mean? Well, if I were to say about my wife, for example, I'm sure one area that she would like to have restored is her capacity to walk without being in a wheelchair. That would be something that she would very much like to have happen and have her, her, her power to walk restored. And so we can focus on that and we ask this question. Well, how will her, her ability to walk be different after 
the Lord's return and the restoration of all things and the remaking of all things as described in the book of Revelation and, and all other scripture passages that says God is going to, well, she's going to be walking. She's going to be fully leaping and walking. And so what we're asking for in a sense, you might think of it this way, is, Lord, we'd like you to please take a little slice of what's coming for Robin and kind of, you know, could you give her a touch of it right now <laughs> to see if she could make some progress in the now. Because we know the day is coming when that's going to get entirely handled. But we need a little of that now. And you could apply that to whatever in your life. You're saying, I've got these various things, but I, I would like to just have, if I think about it, one day where I hurt, where I ache, where I, where I need. It's, the Lord has promised to make all things new. It's going to be, it's going to be handled. But I, I just need a little of that now that already and not yet. You know, I just need a touch of that now. And so we can pray in those ways and we can invite those, those things in that way. That's why I asked the question. So number two, how can you actively invite renewal and restoration into broken areas of your life and your world today? What activities can you engage? What hope can you find? What relationships will help? What delivery systems of grace can you tap into? Now, do you hear the spirit of that question? It's like, get active. Like, restoration is not about sitting around and waiting for the grand miracle to come. Restoration is, find some beginning places. Start where you are. Take some steps. Do some things that make it better. Get into some healing relationships. Get into some healing environments. Get into the Word of God. You know, listen to positive, encouraging people and things and teaching and all of that, you know. Uh, look for faith-building, hope-building um, delivery systems of grace. Connect with the power source of restoration, our Father, our God, in ways that He's coming and made available to you in your daily life now. And so this is a important principle that we, we talked about in the very first John chapter 5 talk. How he, do you want to be remembered? Jesus goes to the pool of Bethsaida. He finds the one guy on the mat. He says to that man, do you want to be whole? Do you want to be well? Do you want to be healed? The man says, I can't because this and that and the other and I'm stuck and I'm broken and I can't fix it. And, blah, blah, blah. and Jesus says, you pick up your mat and walk. Now, he didn't always heal that way. But what he says to us through that is, start where you are. Move those muscles that don't move. Do those, try it. Then do it again tomorrow. Do it again next week. Use your faith. Use your hope. Use your hope. Access whatever sources of grace will help you. Common grace. Remember, we talked about common grace and specific grace. Look for all the opportunities. I mean, kind of think of it like this. If you're sitting in a dark house with the curtains drawn, the light's not coming in, and you're just kind of brooding in your loss and in your hurt and in your ache, and you're going, I'm stuck. This is, this is what I got to look forward to. What can you do? I mean, you're in a bad place. I know. Pull the curtains open and let some light in. <laughs> That's starting where you are. Like, don't sit in the dark. Don't brood. Get up. Open some light into the room. Go out. Breathe some fresh air into your lungs. Do something small, anything that starts to connect to the grace, to the hope and to the faith so what active in invitations of renewal and restoration can you engage what hope can you find what, what relationships will help what delivery systems of grace can you tap into like don't be passive go after restoration and finally what are you hoping for these days? 
What do these hopes have to do with restoration, if anything? What do you find yourself hoping for? Well, I'm hoping for a mate, or I'm hoping for a better income, or I'm hoping for a chance to share my faith, or I'm hoping for a better physical condition, I'm hoping for a better relationship with my my, my children or my friend or, or whatever, you know, I, you know, we all have these hopes that kind of stir around inside of us. And we could say, you know, this is what I'm hoping for. Well, when you, when you kind of pull that down and you think about what, what is it I'm hoping for these days? Do any of those hopes go to the topic of restoration? Are you hoping for something to come back? Are you hoping for some ground to be gained in a process? Of, is that, does that have anything to do with what you're hoping for? If so, connect those dots. Like, find out where the hope and the faith meet the restoration process and see if some of the things you're hoping for might actually be part of what you now understand to be God's interest in being restorative in your life and see if you can connect that together. So those are some ways to engage this topic. There are others, but those are three that I thought of and I thought I'd share them with you. Let's take a moment and pray, and then I think we're going to have just a couple minutes to ask a couple questions or make a couple comments like we did last week. Thank you for doing that. It's always helpful to hear from you what's kind of on your mind after we present a topic like this. So let's just take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the one who was, who is, and who is to come. You're the author and perfecter of faith. You're the great shepherd, the master potter, the lover of our souls, the fountain of our life. You are the destination toward which we are heading and you are the vehicle by which we are getting there. And so tonight we are thankful that we have been given a little more understanding of restoration, the fourth or the third R in our process of healing. And we pray that this will excite some faith and hope in us and focus our faith and hope around maybe one or two things that we're going to exercise our faith and our hope and our love toward believing could be better. By starting where we are, meeting you at that point, and just doing something that we've decided is a good place to begin to move those muscles at your invitation. Holy Spirit, thank you for this time once again. And please continue to meet us in these things for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, any thoughts, questions, anything like that? I mean, I know I'm good, but I don't think I'm that good. No? Oh, I, do I see a hand? Yes. Okay, uh, I, I'm going to repeat the question just for the online people and also so that I make sure I heard you correctly. What is What are some of the best things to engage when you're going through a spiritual warfare experience? Yeah. Did, did I understand correctly? Mm -hmm. Great question. And especially, when, especially as concerns restoration. Maybe there's warfare around restoration. And we talked about this last week. Remember in the process of Nehemiah, repairing the walls of Jerusalem, there was absolute resistance and warfare and, and all kinds of resistance to his progress coming from, you know, his enemies. And we talked about the three different ways that they tried to undermine that. So yes, thank you for bringing up the fact that spiritual warfare is a very important part of this concept of restoration, that it will be resisted by darkness. And so your question, how do we tap into things that can help us get an advantage in that spiritual warfare? So I think a couple things would be helpful. One is to begin by recognizing the reality of spiritual warfare. Every time you get a flat tire doesn't mean the devil gave it to you. Right? Every little thing that happens in our life that's negative or difficult is not necessarily 
a product of spiritual warfare and, and the devil. So we don't want to overdo that. But on the other hand, the other mistake would be to say, I'm never under any kind of resistance. Darkness has absolutely no influence on my life and everything's gravy. That's not true either. The truth is, as we reach for restoration, as we move toward more of what God has, we will encounter resistance from the enemy and from darkness. And we will need to, first of all, just name that. Just recognize it. It's real. It happens. And we, we, we shouldn't be shocked or we shouldn't find it unexpected if we encounter it. So then we can do a couple things. One is we can know the promises of God. We can get into the scriptures. Um, and these days with technology, we have all these beautiful you know, YouTube videos and all these things that will just lay out the promises of God for you to hear and for you to take in and for you to build your faith and help you with that shield of faith that extinguishes the darts of the enemy, the Bible says. But in addition to that, we can share the burden of spiritual warfare with other believers and ask them to pray with us about these things. And we can pray with them about their battles. And we, we are a much better army when we fight side by side than when we're out there all alone on the battlefield. So we can involve others to help us discern and fight the spiritual warfare that we are involved with as we seek to be restored. So knowing the scriptures, the promises of God, and internalizing them, naming spiritual warfare for what it is, getting support and help and, and strength from other believers, standing side by side in, in that sense, praying for one another. And then I think the, the final thing I would say, just kind of off the top of my head to respond to your question is, um, don't quit. Don't don't let discouragement win. In, in Ephesians 6, where it talks about the battle, the full armor of God, it says, having done all, stand. So at least don't let go of the gains God has given you when the enemy tries to steal them from you. But hold on tight to the progress you've made as long as you can and don't seed ground that you don't have to give up out of discouragement and frustration. And to, to get help with that, um, to get assistance with that, to get the word, to get the environments that help build faith, helps help you hold that ground, all these things are good um, ways to address that concern. I'm really glad you brought it up. Did that help answer your question? Yeah, thank oh, you. You bet. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Says, what is the difference between repair and restoration? It seems like it is so. Ah, Mr. or Mrs. Facebook, whoever you may be, thank you for asking that question. Uh, because next week's topic is going to be redemption. And we talked about repair and last week. And so they are correct. There is bleed over into these topics, these three topics of Re uh, repair, restoration, and redemption. And so the distinguishing features of each will be clearer when we hit redemption next week. But um, there is some crossover. And yet there is also some distinctives between repair and restoration. So repair, I think of as, think of Nehemiah. Think of the wall around Jerusalem. He's repairing the wall. He is repairing the gates. My wife had repair of her bones and repair of her brain injury. That was a huge part of her healing. That repair to the walls of the city of Jerusalem was a huge part of, of their, their process of return. But once those walls are fixed, and once those gates are fixed, and once those bones are fixed, then restoration is about what happens after that, what happens next in the story. Restoration is now that I've been repaired, can I now make progress from that point of repair and get get back some of what has been lost? So, and then we'll see next week that that bleeds over into redemption or redeeming, which means buying back the pain, buying back the suffering, buying back the losses, and turning it for good. So, my to answer the question, my distinguishing between repair and restoration is you've got to repair things and. And then it sets you up for restoration. I hope that helps our listener. One more, yes. Um, is uh, forgiving others and forgiving ourselves is part of restoration? A 
okay, I'm gonna repeat your question both for the people online and for us here. Uh, I think I heard you say, is forgiving, including forgiving ourselves, part of restoration? One, huh? And forgiving others. Forgiving others. And forgiving others and forgiving ourselves. 100% part of restoration. Unforgiveness of others, unforgiveness of ourself will impede restoration. Well, if we don't forgive others, we are tied to the wound. We tie ourselves to them with a chain. And when we forgive them, we break that chain and we loosen ourselves from that. It still hurts. There's still issues that may need to go on into a reconciliation process. But the first step is to select forgiveness as a choice. I choose to forgive. I'm now untied from the wound. And now I can begin to see if there's reconciliation that can happen. But then, if I don't forgive myself, I will punish myself. I will make myself pay. I will, I will impede my, my own progress. Because I will, I will either resist progress, because I don't think I deserve it. Or if I do make progress, I'll give it up easily because I don't think I deserve it. And shame will get the last word over me, and that's not God's plan. So I, I, I think I might have shared the story, but if I haven't, I'll just re reference it quickly. About a gentleman who was re in my office some years ago, recovering from an adultery affair and restoring his family. His family was being restored over that year. But at the end of the year, I asked him this question. Did God forgive you? Yes. Did your wife forgive you? Yes. Have you forgiven yourself? No, I don't think I have. A year later, it's time to forgive yourself. So absolutely, 100%. Thank you for asking that question. And with that, I'll let you go and uh, look forward to being with you all again next week. God bless you.